Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. My name is Karen Kay, Recovered Compulsive Eater from Syracuse, New York, and my credit stone transfer. Welcome to the Scottsdale, Arizona-based Vision for You meeting of Overeaters Anonymous. May we open a moment with a moment of silence for the still sick and suffering in and out of the rooms. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things that cannot change. change. Courage to change. Courage to change. 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 The things I can. I can. And the wisdom, the wisdom, to, know wisdom to know the difference. So without any further ado, we're gonna do Harlan and we're on page 117 to the wives, some of the snags and Harlan, the court is yours. Thank you very, very much, Karen. And I, I want to congratulate Karen has become engaged and the lucky man and Karen will be married uh, this fall, this coming autumn. What a wonderful, wonderful event that will be and we wish we want to wish Karen all the mazel, all the gesunde mazel, which means good luck that we can muster and may God smile upon you and your betrothed with nothing but wonderful miracles and happiness. May, may, may your home never be uh, big enough to handle all the miracles that will come your way. So Karen does an enormous amount of service to make this possible along with other people as well. But Karen does a lot of service uh, to make this meeting possible. So she helps a lot of people in many, many ways. It is the 3rd of July, and that means that a lot of people are doing holiday things in, in the United States. If you're not in the United States and you're wondering, what's he talking about? This is our Independence Day, and we're gonna celebrate that tomorrow, but this is a long weekend. So I wanna thank everybody for coming today. I know that it's, it is a holiday weekend. Um, I hope that it is, it is as beautiful where you are as it is today in Arizona. It is about 95 degrees headed for 105, which is not that hot for this time of year in Arizona at all. Um, but it's a beautiful day here, not a cloud in the sky and just gorgeous. I hope it is where you are too, whether you're listening on podcast or listening to us live. We are in the chapter to wives. And a lot of times when we're in the chapter to wives, we can get caught up in the surface meaning of what we're reading. In other words, what do I mean by the surface meaning? Well, you need to be tolerant of the alcoholic. You need to be understanding of the alcoholic. You need to be loving toward the alcoholic. You need to treat the alcoholic with love and kindness and patience. And that's all very, very important. But I also want to point something out that I have been really, really trying to bring out over the last weeks that we have been in this chapter to wives. And what is that very important message? The first thing I want you to call back to is page 18 at the top of the page. And the top of the page on 18, and I'll give you a second to get to the top of page 18. It says, <clears throat> an illness of this sort, and we have come to believe it an illness, involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him, and no one is angry or hurt but not so with the alcoholic illness. <clears throat> For with it, there goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. It engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents. Anyone can increase the list. Now, we're gonna pick this up on page 117. 117, as Karen said before. But before we do, I want to point something out that I feel is so important for me. And if it's important for me, maybe it'll help you too. Let's give it a shot. One of the things that I came in here with, and I don't think I'm alone there. I don't think I'm alone in this. I came into this program with a tremendous, tremendous degree of self-loathing. 
I became the object of ridicule in this program, in this world, not in the program, but it, I've had some abuse from within the program too, but I, I was an object of ridicule. I did not literally or figuratively fit into the world that I was born into. I was not the size that they had in mind when they designed car seats, when they designed the desks at school, when they designed theater seats, airplane seats, when they designed furniture. They don't make furniture to hold a person that is four, 500, 600, 700 pounds. They design furniture for someone who's probably on the low end about 250 and on the high end about 300. And I was well past 300 pounds by the time I was in high school. And so I broke a lot of furniture. And I have a memory, not of the 4th of July weekend when I was so despondent so many, much of the time, because a lot of times it's very lonely for me on a holiday because people are with their families. They're not usually with friends over a holiday. They're with their families most of the time. And that kind of left me out, unfortunately. But one of the things I remember is on a holiday many years ago, I was sitting in the backyard of one of my friends and they were having a Labor Day soiree. They were having a Labor Day barbecue and it had been raining for many days leading up to this Labor Day barbecue. And wouldn't you know it, but my friend who was acting in good faith, he, he loves me and, and all that, he wanted to make sure that I didn't get embarrassed and he put out a chair for me that was a kitchen chair. And I was sitting on the lawn in a kitchen, on a kitchen chair. And slowly but surely, I started noticing that the chair was sinking. It wasn't breaking. It was sinking into the wet ground. And I dared not say anything. And I couldn't really get up. And before I knew it, I was sitting on the ground and the four legs of the chair were completely underneath the surface of the lawn. And there I was sitting on this chair and it took quite a number of people to get me up. Now, the reason that I'm telling you this story is because I'm gonna tie it into the chapter. I'm gonna tie it into what we read about the illness. You see, we're taught to be tolerant and loving and patient and kind with the alcoholics or the compulsive overeaters or the addicts in our lives. But there is something that is just as important, but it doesn't get stated enough in my opinion. If I hate myself, I can't live the best life that I can live. And one of the things that I need to do on a daily basis is chuckle when I sometimes make mistakes to be patient and kind with myself when I fly off the handle, when things just don't go my way. Just the other day, just the other day, I turned on my TV set and all the recordings that I had made were gone. And the cable was just cattywampus. It was just nuts. So I called up the cable company and I'm giving them hell and I'm giving them what for. And I'm thinking, man, I really need to get into the other room and get to work, but I'm giving them hell. And what are they going to do about it? Well, I had to go get another one of the boxes and things like that. And I had to go change it out. And everything's okay now. Nobody died. There were no fatalities from the cable going out. But as I was driving to the cable company to exchange boxes, I did a 10 step. I did step 10. I did it with somebody that's in my God squad. And the person told me, breathe. Everything's okay. It's just television. It's really not the end of the world. And all of a sudden, everything was better. I don't want to hate myself especially over TV. I did nothing wrong, but I can hate myself because 
If I wasn't so fat, then the cable wouldn't have gone out. And if I wasn't so fat, then John F. Kennedy wouldn't have been assassinated. And if I wasn't so fat, then the Cubs wouldn't suck. And if I wasn't so fat, you can, you can understand where we're going with this because this was the signal that I got from the day I was born that if you would just lose weight, everything would be okay. Now I've lost a little over 500 pounds. I am not a morbidly obese person anymore. Now I would love to get some more plastic surgery, but I don't want to go through the pain and I sure as heck don't want to pay the money because I've got bubby arms and I've got lots of things hanging from the old days that I wish weren't there because I'd be maybe look better, you know, if I didn't have this, but I'm not willing to go spend my money nor endure the pain, nor the weeks and weeks of, uh, of uh, inactivity over it. But I'm not morbidly obese anymore by any stretch of anyone's imagination, but I can still hate myself if I'm not careful. So the very same tolerance, the very same compassion, the very same love that I would extend any one of you, I must extend to myself. And I find that as I go through the chapter to wives, and we're gonna to touch on this also when we get to the chapter to the family afterwards, we are not going to let this subject die because it's critical. Let's face a fact, if I am recovered, that means I've had a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps, or I'm recovering, that means I'm working toward a spiritual awakening as the result of the steps. And I hate myself, that's a very tough road to hold. Now there are three sub results of working the steps, three sub results. The result is a spiritual awakening as the result of working the step. Now there are three sub results and I know this is gonna come up in question and answer so I'm gonna do it twice. The first result is that I will be right with God. The second result is that I will be right with myself. And then the third is I will be right with my fellow human being. I'm gonna say that again, it's very important. Number one, the first result is I will get right with God. Number two, I will be right with myself. And number three, I will be right with my fellow human being. Do you know what I used to hate myself about? I used to hate myself over the money that I owed different people. I used to hate myself because I lied and I manipulated people, and I wasn't always honest or forthright or kind. I used to hate myself because I knew that I lived in shame, and I knew that I lived in a lot of anger and fear, even though my weight may have been coming down because I was successfully dieting at the moment. But when I work these steps, and I practice the same tolerance, compassion, pity and love with myself that I practice with my fellow addict. My life gets easier because I don't have to spend time beating on myself or hating myself. And maybe a hundred times a day, I say to myself or others, when people that I'm talking to, they describe a certain behavior or that they've made a mistake or that they've done something that they wish they hadn't have done. Maybe it's not a mistake per se, but it's something that they did that they wish they didn't do. I will say to that person, they have a name for people that do that. And I'll say, do you know what that is? And they'll say a compulsive overeater. And I'll say, no, the people that do that are called human beings. We are human terminally, permanently human. And as human beings, we need to have a good relationship with God. How do we do that? By working the steps. We need to have a good relationship with ourselves. How do we do that? 
by working the steps. And we need to have a good relationship with other people. How do we do that? By working the steps. So you see that no matter what the problem is, working the steps will handle it. Notice I didn't say losing weight or gaining weight. <sighs> Those are good things. I don't want to weigh 300 pounds. I don't want to weigh 400 pounds. I don't, I don't want to weigh that. And I would consider it horrible if I did weigh that. But I'm going to tell you something here that might shock you. If I could only have physical recovery or I could only have spiritual recovery, I would choose the spiritual recovery every time. Every time. I'm not diminishing the importance of physical recovery. I'm not diminishing the vital nature of not putting all that weight on myself. July 28th is a Wednesday morning. It is circled in red on my calendar. I have to go into the cardiologist. And if there's two things in the life of a chubby boy that we don't look forward to, one is buying clothes and two is going to a doctor. Very difficult things to do if you're, if you're way overweight. There's never anything that fits. And if it fits, it just doesn't look right. Somehow, some way, those clothes looked better on Michael Landon or Sean Connery than they did on my 400, 500, 600, 700 pound frame. The suit just doesn't hang the same when you're morbidly obese and going to the doctor is quite shocking because I have been screamed at by doctors from the time I was a baby. And I have vivid memories of doctors screaming at the top of their lungs and throwing things at my mother. And they didn't throw things at my mother. They would throw down their stethoscope or they would throw down a clipboard or they would throw down a, a chart or something. They would just throw it down and they would start screaming at my mother and father in Yiddish. And as I've told you before, when I was nine years old, I was put on very heavy duty amphetamine. And when I was 10 years old, I was switched from one amphetamine to the other. When you're nine years old and you're taking these big amphetamine pills, you don't eat, but it makes you nuts. I remember sleeping literally 15, 20 minutes a month. I mean, I couldn't sleep at night to save my life often, not once or twice, often. Now, when I was a kid, there was three TV channels, not a hundred million of them. There were three TV channels. And then there was a fourth channel. And then, and then, oh my God, we were living large. A fifth was the WTTW, We're Your Window to the World in Chicago, which was the uh, educational channel that you would call PBS today. It wasn't PBS then, but it was PBS. But when, well, we had four channels, not three, I'm sorry. We, WGN was in place my whole life. So we had four channels. CBS was two, NBC was five, and, and ABC was seven, and then nine was WGN. That was where the Cubs were, and wrestling and other stuff like all the sports was on nine. But anyway, that aside, where was I going with that? Oh, I would be up at night watching the late, late, late show and school would be starting at like eight o'clock in the morning or not eight o'clock, 10 minutes to nine in the morning. I went to Chicago public schools. I would be up until seven in the morning, no problem. But I did lose weight and they loved it. Now, why am I going off on such a tangent? Because by this time of the meeting, I'm normally delving into the book. The reason that I'm talking about this stuff is because I believe that it is easier to show love, to show compassion, to show that love and, and, and compassion to others than it often is to ourselves. And this is going to be a process. This is not an event. You know, the second step says came to believe. It doesn't say believed that there was a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity. It says 
came to believe. And that indicates that it's going to be a process. Self-acceptance, self-love, self-esteem uh, uh, for me is a lifelong process. But if I don't do the steps and I don't continue doing them and I don't work at this constantly, I'm never going to get to a point where I have any type of relationship with myself. And I will go outward for validation. I will go outward so that people can validate me. And then I become vulnerable to all sorts of other problems. So in my opinion, this is quite an important topic. And the reason that I'm talking about it again is because in this chapter, we really need to dig a little deeper. Sponsors if or, or whoever, if you are working with someone, don't lose this in the forest when you are working with someone else. I would recommend strongly, and this is what I do, that this chapter is as much about the relationship and compassion we show ourselves as it is about the classification of drinkers and the, the pity, compassion, and love that we are instructed to show to other people. Very, very important. What do I have if I have no relationship with self? What do I have if I have no relationship with a higher power that isn't adversarial? I have a diet with group support and I can't diet for very long. Okay, now let's go to page 117 and we'll finally get started. But I just felt that that other stuff was kind of important to, to, uh, to bring out. I'm on page 117. Some of the snags you will encounter, I'm toward the bottom of the page, are irritation, hurt feelings, and resentments. Your husband will sometimes be unreasonable and you will want to criticize. Remember that that also goes for yourself. Starting from a speck on the domestic horizon, great thunderclouds of dispute may gather. These family dissensions are very dangerous, especially to your husband. Often you must carry the burden of avoiding them or keeping them under control. And how do I do that very specifically? Step 10. If you are not at step 10 yet, you are just beginning your journey, I would advise when you feel these emotions welling up, whether it is towards yourself or toward anyone else, that you reach out into the fellowship, that you make that phone call, make that outreach call. The reason that your sponsors are urging you so strongly to make these calls is because it is vital to our survival. It is vital to our recovery because we cannot fix a broken brain with a broken brain. The brokenness that caused my problem cannot fix the brokenness that caused my problem. Very important. Never forget that resentment is a deadly hazard to an alcoholic. So is self-loathing. We do not mean that you have to agree with your husband whenever there is an honest difference of opinion. Just be careful not to disagree in a resentful or critical spirit. In other words, pause when agitated, do step 10, breathe. Very, very important, pause when agitated. And what do I mean when I say pause? Do step 10. When it says pause when agitated, that's what they're really talking about. You and your, I'm at the top of page 118. You and your husband will find you can dispose of serious problems easier than you can the trivial ones. Next time you and he have a heated discussion, no matter what the subject, it should be the privilege of either to smile and say, this is getting serious. I'm sorry I got disturbed. Let's talk about it later. And sometimes when you are in a situation where it's getting a little heated, a little pause, a little putting it on hold isn't the worst thing in the world. It'll still be there. It's not going to go away, but sometimes this can be very good if you can do it. If your husband is trying to live on a spiritual basis, he will also be doing everything in his power to avoid disagreement or contention. 
So it's very important to remember that some people are not living on a spiritual basis. They're not going to go out of their way to avoid disagreement or contention. You must tap into your reservoir, hopefully it's large, of compassion, patience, and love toward everyone, including yourself. Very important. Your husband knows he owes you more than sobriety. He wants to make good, yet you must not expect too much. His ways of thinking and doing are the habits of years. And this is important. Patience, tolerance, understanding, and love are the watchwords, not only again for others. I feel like I'm beating a dead horse, but I'm not because it's just so easy to forget it. Let's read it again. Patience, tolerance, understanding, and love are the watchwords, not only for others, but for yourself. Very important. Show him these things in show him these things in yourself, and they will be reflected back to you from him. Live and let live is the rule. Live and let live. You know, there are people out there that are living lives. I, we just don't understand. Sometimes we just don't get it. It's not for us to get. It's not for us to understand much of the time. I am not the arbiter of anybody's life. I am not here to judge you. I am not here to pass judgment on anybody and tell you what you should like and what you shouldn't like and where you should go and what you should do. And I'm not here for that. I am not God. I'm just another bozo on the bus. And it is vital to my survival that I never place myself in that situation of being judge, jury, and God forbid executioner of another person. There are people on this line right now, we've got 124, we just had 125, somebody left. Um, but anyway, uh, and, and there are many of you who do things in your life, I just, I don't get it. I, I, I wouldn't understand it. It's not for me to get. It is for me to love you. It is for me to accept you where you are and as you are. Live and let live is the rule. If you both show a willingness to remedy your own defects, there will be little need to criticize each other. We women carry with us a picture of the ideal man. Now remember, we people often carry an image of ourselves of the perfect person. If only I hadn't have done this, if only I could lose weight, if only I was an inch taller, if only I was, if only I was, if only I was, then everything would be perfect. You know what? I have studied this book for many, many, many years. I have been studying this book intensely. And there's not one page or one line that I have found in this book that tells me that I've now arrived at the point where life will be problem free and that there will be no more challenges to my life. There's no avoiding this fact. No matter how evolved my recovery gets, I will never rise above the level of a human being. And as a human being, we are going to do human things. We are going to think human thoughts and we are going to make human mistakes. We would like our husbands, it is the most natural thing in the world. Once his liquor problem is solved to feel he will now measure up to that cherished vision. Wasn't I taught as a child by everyone in my environment? If you just lose weight, everything will be okay. And I lost weight and everything wasn't okay. They lied to me, but they never owned up to it. They kept lying to me and I kept believing them because I figured that they were thin and I was fat. So they must be smart and I'm stupid. The chances are he will, will not for like yourself, he is just beginning his development. Be patient. And also I want to point this out as well. As you are showing love and tolerance and patience to yourself and you are showing love and patience to others, don't forget that there's one other entity in the mix that needs your love and understanding. 
and that needs your patience because sometimes things don't go your way. But if you give God a chance, you will find that there will be miracles in your life beyond your wildest dreams. And sometimes we need to be patient with God. Sometimes we need to put our hands together and say to God, I wanted X, Y, Z. Why did you deny me X, Y, Z? And then say, maybe you've got a better idea. I'm just going to keep working the steps and helping other people. We may not be as benefited by X, Y, Z as we would from ABC or DEF or what have you. God often has a better idea. Don't quit compassion. Don't quit working the steps. Don't quit exercising patience, tolerance, and love with God five minutes before the miracle. We all have pockets of agnosticism from time to time. When I say a pocket of agnosticism, this is what I mean. I have a very strong sense that God created the world. I have a very strong sense of it. I never doubt that. Maybe he didn't. Maybe there really was a big bang. I don't know. I wasn't there. Maybe there was, but I am of the belief that's a little different. I believe that God created the earth. I'm not a Calvinist. Calvinism is everything, including wiping my chin or breathing or Bert and Ernie behind me. Everything is predetermined thousands and thousands. Of, I'm not a Calvinist. What I believe is that God gave us free will. But I believe that God created the earth. Now, is that compatible with evolution? Yes, I believe that it, it is. Yes, it is. But that's not the reason that we're here today is to discuss my belief in God or what I believe or what I don't believe. But a pocket of agnosticism comes from, can I believe that a God, a power greater than myself, no he, no she, no it, no offensive language to offend anyone, give it the nomenclature that you want, worship it in the way you choose, do with it as you see fit, can and will take an active role in my life. That I am a child of this higher power. That I am a child of this higher power. So that when I go to the doctor, when I'm not at the doctor, when I walk down the street, I can call upon this higher power to protect me from myself and my illness. Can I believe that that's true? And often these pockets of agnosticism come from doubt that comes from being disappointed and hurt. People hurt us. We blame them, but we also blame God. People did terrible things, holocausts and murders and, and buildings falling down and all these other things that we see and read about every day. And we say, where was God? He was there crying with the people that made bad decisions. And he wasn't, well, he was crying with them too. He was there with the victims when others made bad decisions. God doesn't tell people to go kill somebody else, but he's right there when the mourners are gathered together <sighs> and he heals. That's what I believe. Maybe you don't, that's okay. But I have to be as patient and loving and understanding as I can with all the entities here. And that includes my higher power. Now, these beliefs that I espoused are mine. They are not right or they're not wrong. They're just my beliefs. If you disagree with them, that's okay. I'm still going to love you. The only reason I brought them into this forum is because I wanted to give an example of how this works in my life. I didn't bring it into this forum to suggest that this is how you should believe or what you should think, because it's none of my business what you believe and none of my business what you think. 
So please don't think for any length of time, be it a second or a century, that I am telling you I'm right about God and you're wrong. Uh-uh, 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 uh uh I am just telling you what I believe to illustrate the point that yes, I believe God did this, this, and this, but nobody zapped me with a magic wand and made me thin overnight. It took a long time to get under 400 pounds. I remember vividly, vividly going to a doctor and weighing in at 398. I was 407 the last time I was there and I lost nine pounds. And when I was under 400 pounds, my eyes were full of tears of joy and my heart beat a different beat because I never in my wildest imagination ever believed that there would be a day when I'm under 400 pounds. And there it was in black and white. And the nurse, the doctor didn't weigh me, the nurse weighed me and she said, 398, good job, you lost seven pounds. And I was like Barishnikov. I was dancing in my mind. I was dancing and I was so happy to be 398. Do I want to be 398 now? God, no. God, no. But I remember when I was 398. Do I believe that there is a power greater than myself that could restore me to sanity? Yes. But if things don't go my way today or tomorrow, I may resurrect pockets of agnosticism. An atheist believes that there is no religious deity and that's okay. Jimmy Burwell was an atheist. Hank Parkhurst was an atheist. That's okay. All that's required here is a willingness to believe that there is a power greater than myself. And then there are believers, religious people, whether they're religion is is whatever a b c whatever that is that may not believe that god will intervene in their desire to eat a big mac that is a pocket of agnosticism i may believe in a god that occupies the bigger picture the gestalt that split the Red Sea or the burning bush or Lake Michigan or whatever, you know, the Great Lakes. By the way, I'll teach you a little thing. How, you, how do you remember all the Great Lakes? Just remember, we, if we live in Chicago, which I don't anymore, it's Holmes, H-O-M-E-S. Why am I talking about this? But I might as well finish. Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior, Holmes. We live in the Great Lakes states. How do we remember all the names of the Great Lakes? Homes, Huron, Ontario, Michigan, Erie, and Superior. Good, good tool for any of you who want to remember the names of the five Great Lakes. Okay, I don't know why we're talking about the Great Lakes. I should probably see a psychiatrist or something at some point, but Anyway, okay. So you never know what you're going to get here. You just, you never know. You're going to get all kinds of stuff here. Narish kite and good stuff. You never know. Okay. Let's get back to the book. I'll, I'll, rem I'll remember to take my crazy pill later on today. I should have taken it this morning, but I, or my anti-crazy pill, but I didn't take it this morning. Okay. I'm at the bottom of 118. It's really not 20 to 11. Oh my God. Another feeling we are likely to entertain is one of resentment that love and loyalty could not cure our husbands of alcoholism. We do not like the thought that the contents of a book or the work of another alcoholic uh, has accomplished in a few weeks that for which we have struggled for years. At such moments, we forget that alcoholism is an illness over which we could not possibly have any power. Your husband will be the first to say it was your devotion and care which brought him to the point where he could have a spiritual experience. Without you, he would have gone to pieces long ago. When resentful thoughts come, try to pause, step 10, and count blessings. That those gratitude lists, it's not really in the steps. I, I'm not telling you you need to do one. I'm not judging you if you do or you don't. 
I tried, I don't try. I do one every day. I walk three miles in the morning. I am so grateful. I stick vision for you in my ear and I make sure that the, uh, that the garbage is in a bag and I take it out and I walk three miles in the morning, six days a week. I don't do it on Saturday. I'm so happy to have that one day where I don't do it. But anyway, it's really hot when that sun comes up. I caramba. So I try to walk when it's dark. So I leave the house about 4.15 uh, in the morning, usually a 4.15, 4.30 at the latest. So I can maximize the amount of walking I do while it's dark. But while I'm walking, I am thinking about what the person is sharing on the phone. But then when there's like, they're taking the names or they're saying, where are you from? Or can I be heard or whatever? I think about how lucky I am. I think about um, the, 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 I, six years ago, June the 30th was just the other day. Six years ago on June the 30th, I closed on this house. Now, not only have I made money on this house, because real estate here is going cuckoo bananas, you know, it's going cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs, but this is my house and I have a car and I can walk and I can see and I can smell and I can, I can hear. And I, I mean, there's so much to be grateful for. And I have a way of life. I have a way of life that answers all my problems today. There are so many people out there looking for that roadmap. I have it. I don't always follow it perfectly, but at least I have a roadmap to get me from where I am to where I want to be. And the book is called Alcoholics Anonymous. And in 1939, when the book came out, they started calling it the big book because it was a big book. And why, is, why was it big? Because thick paper is cheaper than thin paper. And they printed it on the thickest paper that they could find. I have a first edition, uh, pr first printing book and it's thick paper. And so the book was big and Bill Wilson was a, was a salesman. He was a salesman. And he wanted it big and red and yellow. And I mean, he wanted people to buy it. When it first came out, you couldn't give it away. And that's why it's called the big book. But this book is what gives me the answers to all of my problems today. After all, your family is reunited. Alcohol is no longer a problem. And you and your husband are working together toward an undreamed of future. Now, I want to give you a little history. I'm running out of time. Lois Wilson was not very pleased that this Ebby Thatcher, who she knew from the time he was in the stroller. In those days, they didn't call it a stroller. They called it a baby buggy. When I was a little kid growing up in Chicago, there was no such thing as a stroller or a whatever it is, car seat. No, we didn't have, there was no such thing as this. It was, you, you rock the baby and you push the baby in the buggy. And one of the first things that we bought my daughter, my daughter lives in Brooklyn, New York. It's either Crown Heights or Crown Point. I think it's Crown Heights, Brooklyn. One of the first things we bought her when she was a baby, I mean, maybe one, well, that wasn't the first thing. One of the first things we gave her after she had language was a st little stroller for her doll. And I said, here's your baby buggy, sweetheart. And she said, dad, it's not a buggy, it's a stroller. Oh, sorry. Okay. It's a stroller, but I didn't know I was born in 1954 from, from my money. It's a buggy. What the heck do I know? But anyway, Lois Wilson knew Ebby when he was in the buggy and she knew that he was a bum and a drunk and he was an inebriate and he wasn't reliable and he wasn't a very nice person. A lot of Ebby Thatcher was not the world's nicest guy. He was a sardonic kind of guy, very sarcastic. Uh, he could be very negative. He was a drunk. He was a drunk. And this is the guy that gets him sober? What the heck is going on here? Bill started drinking big time in 1917. This was 1934. For 17 years, Lois tried to sober his drunk ass up. 
and she could not do it. There were flights from city to country and back. What does that mean? She went with him on these geographics, the, the Burnhams, Lois is a Burnham. Lois Burnham married Bill Wilson. The Burnhams had a home in Manchester, Vermont. That's how she knew Bill. That's how she knew Ebby. That's how she knew Roland. That's how she knew these people. The wealthy people had summer homes in Manchester, Vermont. And that's how she knew these people. And this Ebby comes in in November of 1934. And now Bill is sober? What the hell is going on here? And this doctor in Ohio? Who the heck is this guy? Who the hell is this doctor in Ohio that Bill left uh, New York in April of 1934? 1935, excuse me, 1935. He didn't come home till late September. This is why you're staying in Ohio and I've got to handle everything by myself? You're just going to leave me here? You're just going to leave me here with no help at all? That's what happened. She couldn't get him sober. This was written sort of as a missive to Lois. It was sort of a parenthetic, sort of a uh, uh, between the lines letter to Lois that sometimes your love and devotion is not going to be enough that it's what? It's going to take what? It's going to take another drunk to get a drunk sober. She threw a shoe at his butt. She threw a shoe right at his head. It was a Tuesday night. They were going to an Oxford group meeting. Lois was standing on her feet all day long at, uh, at uh, Macy's department store. She comes home, he's been home all day and he's telling Lois, hurry up, Lo, we're gonna be late. She took her shoe and threw it right at his fricking head because enough was enough. Now he's gonna hustle me out the door when I've been trying to get him sober for 17 fricking years. Now this is early 1935. He has been sober all of three months. Three months he is sober and I'm the one that's gotta hurry up because we're gonna be late. Zoom, that shoe went flying across the room. Okay, let's continue. Still another difficulty is that you may become jealous of the attention he bestows on other people, especially alcoholics. Don't think that they didn't have that discussion a few times. I got to cook for these guys now? Now I got to clean up after these guys? Now I, now we're, we're, it's the depression. We don't have a pot or a window. Now I got to feed these guys and what, who's staying at our house? Cause Bill would say, okay, why don't you stay with us and come on. And one of the guys killed himself. Bill C killed himself. He sold off a lot of their belongings to a pawn store, pawn shop. Well, the bottom line is this is very well illustrated by the history of Bill and Lois. Let's continue. You have been starving for his companionship, but he's, yet he spends long hours helping other men in their families. You feel he should now be yours. This paragraph may have well have been titled, Dear Lois. The fact is that he should work with other people to maintain his own sobriety. Sometimes he will be so interested that he becomes really neglectful. Your house is filled with strangers. You may not like some of them. She didn't like some of these guys. She thought they were jerks when they were drinking and jerks when they were sober. And by the way, your goddamn cigarette butt is, your ashes are all over my floor now. And I've got to clean up after your drunk butt. He gets stirred up about their problems, but not at all about yours. It will do little good if you point that out and urge more attention for yourself. We find it a real mistake to dampen the enthusiasm, his enthusiasm for alcoholic work. You should join in his efforts as much as you possibly can. 
we suggest that you now direct some of your thought to the wives of his new alcoholic friends. They need the counsel and love of a woman who has gone through what you have. And in 1950, a woman by the name of Ann Bingham, who was a society woman whose husband was a drunk, and Lois Wilson, just 15 years after the formation of Alcoholics Anonymous in 1950, they formed a program called Al-Anon for the wives. I told you this paragraph should be titled Dear Lois. And that's exactly what she did. And she formulated that with Ann Bingham. And she remained active in Al-Anon until she died at age 88. It is probably true that you and your husband have been living too much alone or drinking many times isolates the wife of an alcoholic. Therefore, you probably need fresh interests and a great cause to live for as much as your husband. If you cooperate rather than complain, Lois, you will find his excess enthusiasm will tone down. Both of you, both of you will awaken to a new sense of responsibility for others you as well as your husband ought to think of what you can put into life instead of how much you can take out. And we're so given to taking and we're so given to wanting, where's mine, where's mine, where's mine? We need to trust God and help others. And when I take that tact, remember that Dr. Silkworth calls us an altruistic movement. Remember that the Oxford group Notice Frank Bookman, he went to China, Bookman, and he noticed these people in China who had a zeal and enthusiasm for Christ. And how did they get it? Through altruism. What does altruism mean? It means giving with no thought of return. No. Again, I say this all the time. Guys, we're not in the results business. We're not give and give. We are not in the results business. Inevitably, your lives will be fuller for doing so. You will lose the old life to find one much better. Perhaps your husband will make a fair start on the new basis, but just as things are going beautifully, he dismays you by coming home drunk. If you are satisfied, he really wants to get over drinking. You need not be alarmed, though it is infinitely better that we have no relapse at all as has been true with many of our men. It is by no means a bad thing in some cases. Your husband will see it at once that he must redouble his spiritual activities if he expects to survive. You need not remind him of his spiritual deficiency. He will know of it. Cheer him up and ask him how you can be still more helpful. The slightest sign of fear or intolerance may lessen your husband's chance of recovery. In a weak moment, he may take your dislike of his high-stepping friends as one of those insanely trivial excuses to drink. We never, never try to arrange a man's life so as to shield him from temptation. The slightest disposition on your part to guide his appointments or his affairs so, <clears throat> so he will not be tempted will be noticed. Make him feel absolutely free to come and go as he likes. This is important. If he gets drunk, don't blame yourself. God has either removed your husband's liquor problem or he has not. If not, it had better be found out right away. Then you and your husband can get right down to fundamentals. If a re repetition is to be prevented, place the problem along with everything else in God's hands. And that's why I unashamedly, I am not ashamed of this. I am not regretful of this. If I say Oreo cookies, pizza, Reese's peanut butter cups, and you go out and eat those commodities, and I, you do not have me to blame. You are going to eat them anyway. If you are in fit spiritual condition, you, you could be chin deep in Oreo cookies and you will not eat one Oreo cookie. And they just will not go in your mouth. If you are not in fit spiritual condition, you will go out in a freaking snowstorm when the Chicago Police Department on WGN is urging you, do not leave the house unless you have to. There is a snow advisory for Will County, Cook County, Dade, uh, uh, DuPage County, uh, Lake County, do not leave the house if you don't have to. And there I am, there I am driving down the street because I got to have my fix. Nope, I'm going to mention food 
And if you go out and eat that food, it's on you, baby, not on me. Top of 121, we realize that we have been giving you much direction and advice we may have seemed to lecture. If that is so, we are sorry, but we ourselves don't always care for people who lecture us. But what we have related, what we have related is based upon experience, some of it painful. I sure don't want anybody throwing a shoe at me. We had to learn these things the hard way. That is why we are anxious that you understand it, that you avoid these unnecessary difficulties. So to you out there who may soon be with us, we say good luck and God bless you. And I am going to read the bottom here because this is very important. If you would like to know why the Al-Anon program came about or what its history is, it is because of the very struggles, the very challenges that we have been discussing in this vital chapter. And the struggles are that many times we want to regulate or we want to to control another person's behaviors, or we want them to behave a certain way so that we can feel better about ourselves. We have a scale and it's not tipping our way and he's spending all this time with the drunks and he's not spending any time with me, et cetera, et cetera. Very, very important that we release that and that all that stuff be given to God. Very bottom of 121, if you have a fourth edition, which I do, this is what you see. Asterisk, the Fellowship of Al-Anon Family Groups was formed about 13 years after this chapter was written. Though it is entirely separate from Alcoholics Anonymous, it uses the general principles of the AA program as a guide for husbands, wives, relatives, friends, and others close to alcoholics. The foregoing pages, <clears throat> excuse me, though addressed only to wives, indicate the problems such people may face. Alateens for teenage children of alcoholics is a part of Al-Anon. If there is no Al-Anon listing in your local telephone book, you may obtain further information on Al-Anon Alateen Family Groups by writing to its World Service Office, 1600 Corporate Landing Parkway, Virginia Beach, Virginia, and then the zip code. Today, it would be a website that I'm sure that they would give. But this fourth edition came out in 2001. And I didn't get a computer until 1995. The reason I got it was my daughter was born in 94. And so we, we got it and uh, so on and so forth. But um, I believe that now they'll have the website in there. So um, this is very, very important chapter. This is a very important chapter, not because it tells you how to handle the alcoholic. That is so ridiculous. When I hear people say that, I, I end up screaming into a pillow. Uh, but it's not about how to handle the alcoholic. It's about how to use the steps and use this God-given patience, tolerance, and love in our own lives when the behaviors of others are upon us in a way that may seem threatening or may seem unfair or are not going according to our script. And beyond that, which is very, very important for me to remember, boys and girls, is that it is also very important for me to work these steps, to practice these principles as these behaviors relate to me. Because ultimately what I have in the final analysis is a relationship with the only person in the world that I will be with from birth to death, and that is me. And a relationship with that being who gave me life, not my mother, my mother gave me life, my father gave me life, I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about my relationship with a higher power. And so as I proceed into my life, I must remember that my serenity is equal to my acceptance and my faith and the work that I'm doing to be a better recovered person today than I was yesterday. 
that we are in the grips of a permanent, progressive and fatal disease. And so many people appreciate the fatal nature and so many people appreciate the permanent nature. But the one P in there, my friend in Tulsa, Oklahoma says it's the three P's, permanent, progressive and fatal. But um, he's, a, he's a card, he's a, he's a definite card. Many of you know him, but um, the progressive nature. And what does that mean progressive? It's going to get worse all the time, whether I'm eating or not. 25 years, the man of 30 remained bone dry. And within four years after picking up liquor, he was dead. It's permanent and it's progressive and it's fatal. So let's all now transition. Before I give it back to Karen, I'm going to again ask you for your prayers to bless the and she's a wonderful person, does a lot of service. So let's always remember her in our prayers. I also want to thank all the people that do service for this, not just Karen, but there's others too that made this possible. This is about a year now. This started out as a coffee clatch at, at a place called the Coffee Plantation in, Spring, in uh, Springfield, in Scottsdale, Arizona. And then it went to the phone and then it became a Zoom thing. I think it was Sue that kind of, Sue and Lauren kind of pushed it and, and into the Zoom era there. And, and I, I wasn't that technologically astute, but they did it. But anyway, um, no math questions, please. No food questions, please. No questions about the current Cub losing streak. It, believe me, it's breaking my heart. I, I picked up a Cub t-shirt to wear today. Uh, I picked up a Cub t-shirt and I had to put it back down and I grabbed a Ducks t-shirt. I can't wear a Cubs t-shirt today. My heart is shattered in a thousand pieces. If you did ask a question last week, we're going to ask you to please um, step back and um, let the other people ask their questions who did not ask one last week. And then at the end, um, if, if there's time, you can step forward. But three things, no food, no math. And if you asked a question last week, kind of step back. Okay, that said, I'm gonna, add, I'm gonna throw it back to Karen um, and we'll, we'll proceed with questions and answers. Thank you, Harlan, and another stellar job. And I also like to again, thank um, um, Sue Al for being a co-host and our question and answer and Cheryl Ann for being a co-host today. And thank you once again, Harlan. Uh, we have the go to the reactions and you can raise your hand. And also you can put um, something in, in the chat. Sue is uh, very quick with that. And with that, I will pass. Thank you. It's all yours, Sue. Thanks, Karen. Um, and uh, just in the spirit of um, giving credit where credit's due, Maria, 